I want to talk to you about what is the reality of sihr. Why does it occur? What is the 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 haqiqa? We call it in Arabic. Where does it where does it come from? Sihr is very easy to understand if you understand the psychology and the physical differences that men have from jinn. If you understand the jinn and the world of the jinn, you will understand sihr. Because sihr is the overlap between the world of men and the world of jinn. Very briefly, jinn as we know are created from, uh, the Arabic calls it uh, that uh, uh, a fire that doesn't have a smoke, a smokeless fire. Okay, And if you want to be technical, we can call it a type of energy. So the jinn has potential to go at the speed of light essentially. The jinn has the potential to go through physical barriers because the jinn is not material. The jinn is not flesh and blood. The jinn is not matter, the jinn is energy. So the jinn can go through material at the speed of light. And the jinn, because it doesn't have a form, a lot of people say, what does a jinn look like? What does a ghost look like? What does it look like? And the response is, it doesn't look like anything. It can take on any shape. It's not a physical matter. It can take any shape it wants to and be a, a man, be a dog, be anything. It doesn't have a particular shape. So the jinn has the physical power to be much faster than man and to go through physical barriers because it's energy. Like we have the waves of the telephone come through the, 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 the walls of the, the masjid. So too the jinn can go through and come out, not a problem. Additionally, the jinn, very interestingly enough, and we learned this from the story of Suleiman. It has a very, very amazing power. I say Einstein's theory is proven in the story of Suleiman. In the story of Suleiman, we learned that the jinn even has the power to transform matter into energy and to take that energy from one place to another and retransform it back into matter. In other words, E equals MC squared can be proven in its own way. In other words, what can the jinn do? According to the story of Suleiman, the jinn went from Jerusalem and to Yemen and took the or promised to do this and said, I can bring the throne back to you before you stand up. Right? So the jinn said, I can go all the way to Yemen and within a millisecond before you stand up is a millisecond within a millisecond, I will bring that throne. The throne would have been bigger than this podium behind us, bigger than this stage. It's a throne that was magnificent. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَهَا عَرْشٌ عظيم. The jinn said, I'll bring it back for you by the time you stand up and you'll have it in front of you. And the throne would have come, I mean, you're not going to see the chair flying in the sky. The jinn would have taken the throne and somehow, in a way that Allah knows best, take it in its hidden energy form and then bring it all the way to Jerusalem and then retransform it back into the throne. The jinn had the capacity to do that. The fact that Allah mentioned the fact that this was impressive, the facts that all of the jinn, only one stood up, it kind of sort of shows this is the pinnacle of what a jinn can do. This isn't your average run-of-the-mill jinn. This isn't the jinn living in Dallas or, or Houston or California. This is one of the most strongest jinns of the entire world, if not the strongest, telling Suleiman, I can do that. But the concept is there, that jinn can go super fast speed, and the jinn can go through objects. And therefore, when a jinn is able to tell you something that's happening in another part of the world, what's so surprising? Imagine if you had a cell phone, and you're speaking to somebody on the other side of the world, and the guy tells you what's happening as he describes it. Would you be surprised? No. Similarly, if the jinn is able to just go and tell you there's a hidden treasure over there, why is that surprising? The jinn lives for a thousand years, maybe on average, or longer than that. Jinns live much longer than men. And so, if some man buries a treasure in the middle of the desert, some jinn knows about it, and they'll tell the word, oh, there's a treasure over there. And when it's handy, a jinn is going to say, oh, there's treasure buried over there. He's going to say it to his, you know, uh, uh, magician or whatnot, and eventually they will find it. So the jinns have capabilities we do not have. They are faster than men. They are more powerful than men. The average jinn is more powerful than the average man. Again, that doesn't mean they're super powerful. That doesn't mean they're infinitely powerful. Only Allah Azza wa Jal is infinitely powerful. But the average jinn is physically stronger than the average man. I myself have seen a little lady, petite lady, five foot tall, literally. It's just a young teenager possessed by jinn. We were doing ruqya on her and ten men were holding her down. 
at least seven, when I say ten, ten, seven men were holding her down and she's struggling to throw all of them off. And my friend was, was there in the audience as well. And he grabbed her, he had to because she was harming people. He grabbed her, what do you call this lock? What do you call that when you grab from behind? Huh? The body lock, right? Right? He, like that one. He grabbed her from behind because she was punching men and everything. And this is a little lady. She took her head and she whammed right back on his nose. And the guy is like, what's going on here? So this is, I saw with my own eyes, five foot. And she became more powerful than seven men. But in the end, seven, eight men eventually did bring her down. She wasn't stronger than all of them. Physically, stronger than the average man, but still manageable. You can bring them down. It's not as if they're all powerful and whatnot. Only Allah is all powerful. So these are there physically. They can do things we don't understand. But it's just like a horse can gallop faster than us. Like an elephant is stronger than us. The only thing that freaks us out is that the jinn is invisible to our eyes. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ They see you from a paradigm you cannot see them from. They can choose when to show themselves to you. They can see you from their world. We cannot see them unless they choose to show us their world. So there's nothing to be scared about. Allah gave them certain powers He didn't give us. Like He gave animals other powers He didn't give us. But Allah blessed us over the jinn. How do we know this? Allah told the jinn to prostrate to Adam. Allah preferred the Adam over and Bani Adam over Malaika and Jinn. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا Bani Adam. Bani Adam have been lifted up and put on the pedestal in the hierarchy of things and the angels and the Jinn were told to bow down to Adam. Adam is superior to the Jinn. Why? Because Adam has something far greater than physical strength, than speed, than going at the speed of light. Adam has intellect and Jinns don't have that level of intellect. And this shows us, by the way, the power of the mind is more blessed than the power of the body. The mind is more important than physical strength. Allah blessed Adam with a greater intellect, a greater faham. عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ Allah taught Adam. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا The angel said, Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana. So Adam was blessed over the malaika and over the jinn because of the power of the aql, because of the faham that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave. And therefore, intellectually speaking, the jinn are nowhere near as intelligent as men are. Some have said they are like children in their intellect compared to men. And that's one of the reasons why they're so stubborn, as every Raqi knows. Just stubborn like a toddler throwing a tantrum and not wanting to give up. Hours go by and they're not going to give up. That stubbornness is because of their, their intellectual capabilities. So, the... Bani Adam are more intelligent than the jinn and Allah has blessed them above the jinn. Therefore, the jinns from the very beginning have had what modern psychologists call an inferiority complex. Jinns suffer from a severe inferiority complex because the jinns felt, hey, I should have been there. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran that Iblis says, Ana khayrun min. That was supposed to be me. Why did you tell Adam to be the one on the podium? I'm the one that's supposed to be there, right? So the jinns always wanted to be number one. The jinns always wanted to be the best, but they're not. So they suffer from an inferiority complex. Now, given the fact that they have an inferiority complex and yet they are stronger and faster and physically more powerful than men, what is the net result? The net result is there is a world and that world was a fitna that Allah taught to early man. The story of Babel in Babylon. Right? Right? In the nutshell of a story, that Harut and Marut were angels that Allah sent to the ancient city of Babylon. 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, the earliest city of mankind was Babylon. And Allah sent two angels to inform mankind because this is ilm al ghaib Mankind would never have known at all that we can communicate with the jinn. 
So Allah sent Harut and Marut. And Harut and Marut were angels. And they taught mankind that we are a test from Allah. Do not come close to us. We are a test from Allah. Literally, like the warning signs, you know, the carbon radioactive dating, do not come close. The angels are telling them, our job is to test you. Get out of here, don't listen to us. But what were they going to test them with? The knowledge of how to communicate with the jinn. So they explained a methodology and they said, if you follow us, if you listen to us, this is kufr. So all of the methodologies and mechanisms to call out to the jinn, they are madhabs that go back to this origin because they're different madhabs. You have the Ouija board, you have the, uh, the dolls, what is it called, the, the voodoo dolls, okay? You have the, the knots that are blown. These are all different madhabs that all go back to the experiences of the Sahara, of the magicians that goes back to the origin of Harut and Marut in the city of Babylon. So initially man was taught, this is what you do. If you wanted to call the jinn, and if you call the jinn, it is kufr, don't do it. Mankind didn't care. They said, we want to do it. And thus magic began. What is magic therefore? Magic, as I said, sihr, is the intersection of the world of men with the world of jinn. These two worlds are not meant to be intersected. These two worlds are meant to be separate. And if an accidental uh, crossing takes place, it is easier to repel. As any raqi knows, if a jinn comes into our world and causes some fitna and fasad on its own, it's much easier to repel rather than sihr. Because what sihr is, is the following. Listen to me, five minutes and you will understand magic and inshallah never be scared of it for the rest of your lives. Magic is an evil person who has sold his soul to the devil in order for the shayateen to perform some tricks for him. It's like you feed your horse or your pony to go gallop fast. The only difference is you're not feeding a horse or pony, you are feeding a demon. A shaitan. And the difference is that what the, the sahir or is doing is giving the jinn the one thing that the jinn wants. What does the jinn want? Your American Express card with expiration date? Your cash? What is the jinn going to do with your cash? What is the jinn going to do with your money? They don't have currency in the jinn world. What does the jinn want? What has it always wanted? Sisters, I want to ask you, what did the jinn want? Superiority, so how are they going to get it? What do you have to do? Lower yourself in front of the demon. You have to become the slave of the jinn. The biggest myth I want to destroy is the false idea that the sahir controls the jinn. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is the jinn that controls the sahir. The magician is a filthy, evil, disgusting creature of a human, excuse of a human, that has sold itself and its dignity and its izza and its iman and its taqwa in order to do sacrilegious deeds for the demon. And that's why these things of get a, a toad of a, you know, eye of a newt and go to the graveyard at 3 a.m. and get the blood of a donkey. Why? Because the jinn wants to see that sahir humiliate himself. Go to the graveyard at 3 a.m. Do tawaf around the grave. Who's going to do that? Only somebody who has sold himself to the devil. So the shaitan feels a sense of ego. Look what I can make this guy do. Right? Re run him around with the tip of my finger. Do whatever I tell him to do. So the sahir becomes the worshipper of the jinn, not the other way around. How can a human being control a jinn? How can anybody believe this? By what will a human control a jinn? Whips? Chains? What? How will a human control a jinn? There is nothing that the human has that the jinn can be controlled by. That's what Allah gave to Sulaiman. No other person has that power. The jinn controls the human emotionally. It tells the human, do this, do this, do this. The human does it. In return, what does the jinn do? Some tricks and trades to make the magician happy. You want me to go and harm somebody? I'll go harm somebody. Now you got to go and worship me in this manner. You want me to go plant some bad stuff in a person's house or possess a body or break up a marriage? Okay, I'll go do that. And now you continue to worship me. The jinn does something utterly trivial for its world 
In its world, it just does something that it is physically capable of doing. Allah gave the jinn certain natural powers to be invisible, to be super fast, to do things hidden manner. For example, uh, uh, the most common type of magic is where a husband and wife are not able to have a happy marriage. And if conjugal relations are attempted, perhaps something supernatural, perhaps the husband feels a physical pressure, perhaps something happens. These are things that are manifestations of the jinn. It's not that difficult for the jinn to push a man back. How is that difficult? Why are we scared of the jinn? The jinn is simply like a bug, an insect. You understand it has certain irritable qualities, but you're, it's not going to, you understand it. It's not something you need to be like supernaturally terrified of. If you understand that the magician is the one selling itself, himself to the jinn, and the jinn is returning the favor, and so why is the magician doing it? The magician wants your money. The magician lives in our world. So you go to the magician and you pay the magician in American Express. He'll accept American Express, okay? He'll accept Visa and credit card. He'll accept cash in any currency. Give me a hundred dollars and I'll do the potion. You give the guy a hundred dollars and the magician will do the potions that the jinn wants. And then the jinn will then go and basically uh, listen to the, to the magician only because it wants more worship being done. Now, another thing we need to know is that Jinns work in gangs. <laughs> Jinns are the mafia. So the magician approaches the godfather, the dawn. Okay? The jinn approaches the dawn, the godfather. And the godfather sends its minions. Generally, not the one that is approached isn't the one that will go and do the sending. It's the you know the, the, the worker <laughs> the worker class of the jinn. They're the ones that are sent, right? Because the godfather jinn has an entire mafia under his disposal. Thousands and thousands of jinn. And you just send the jinn, so that jinn will then be persistent for years, decades, and live in your house, cause issues. And that jinn is getting whatever recognition and I don't know their internal currency, but it's getting a benefit from the dawn. Right, it's getting something from the big guy, and so it's doing what it does. And a lot of times, it's also scared of the big guy. A lot of times, it's terrified of the big guy. Once I was doing ruqya, uh, and uh, I said to the jinn, after a long time, why are you still here? Just leave. And the jinn said, I can't leave. I said, why? Just leave. And the jinn said, I'm scared. If I go, then he will kill me. Who is going to kill you? The one who put me here. The one who brought me here, meaning the head jinn, or whatever the dawn would be. I'm scared he's going to kill me. He's going to hurt me. So I have to stay here. So internally, they're doing whatever they can and they're getting it done. So bottom line, sihr is merely the intersection of the world of men and the world of jinn. Once you understand the reality of this world, you should not be scared of it in the slightest. It is a nuisance. It is an irritation, but it's not something that brings about supernatural fear. Fear. Also, realize this, that the jinn is absolutely terrified of Allah and the name of Allah and the dhikr of Allah and the speech of Allah. The jinn is terrified. And that is why if ever in your life you feel the presence of a jinn, you, you see something supernatural, it will be terrified if your bravery is manifested to it because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that you have no fear, and I have experienced this, and I know all of the Raqis in the audience know this firsthand. You stare at it straight, and you just say, as the Prophet taught us to say, memorize this phrase, Bismillah, Ana Abdullah, Ukhruj Allah. Three phrases. Memorize them. Bismillah, in the name of Allah. I'm not powerful. I'm not going to do anything. I am connecting with Allah. Bismillah. I am the servant of Allah. I speak with Allah's name now. I'm not speaking in my name. I speak in the name of Allah. Get out, O enemy of Allah. You say this with firmness and you will see. I hope it protects all of you. I hope you don't see. <laughs> but if that ever happens, now, the opposite, and I understand it's a bit terrifying, but put yourself now in the psychology of the jinn. If you start wailing, screaming, cowering, what have you done, brothers and sisters? What have you done to the psychology of the jinn? Louder. Empowered it. 
empowered it. That's exactly what it wants to see. You groveling in the corner, terrified. That's what gives it the power. And that's why Hadith in Abu Dawood, our Prophet said, there was a man who was on his camel, and the camel for no reason reared backward and was about to throw the man off. And the camel said, لَعْنَةُ ala shaitan. Allah's curse be on shaitan. The Prophet said, don't say that. When you say that, shaitan becomes so big, he's bigger than a house. Because you have mentioned him as the cause of your animal rearing upwards. Rather, listen to this, say Bismillah, and shaitan will shrink until he's smaller than an ant. This hadith shows us, when you connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you're doing is you are shrinking the power of the jinn. You're eliminating the power of the jinn. The only issue comes with this, we conclude, I know much more can be said. With sihr, it's not that easy to kick it out because there's a binding that takes place. There's a knot that has happened. There's some type of issue. So it requires long sessions with a professional or yourself. Feel free to do it with yourself as well, but just know what you're doing. Ask us, uh, an expert or whatnot, and you can do ruqya on yourself. There is no easy way to battle sihr. Uh, I, 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 have you guys done the symptoms of sihr? Have you done the symptoms of sihr? Number one symptom of sihr is bizarre, scary dreams. Number two system of, uh, symptom of sihr is you feel somebody is there when nobody is there. You have your conscious, there's an entity or a power. Number three symptom of sihr is inexplicable problems or disasters that cannot be explained. Okay, anything that science can explain, medicine can explain is not sihr. You go to the doctor, the doctor says, oh, you have this issue, that's not sihr. If the doctor can analyze it and the doctor tells you this is the problem, that's not sihr. Sihr is supernatural problem. Sihr, it doesn't make any sense. You wake up and there are bruises on your back. You wake up, there's marks here. You're having constant miscarriages and the doctor's like, everything is normal. I've done all the tests and there's constant miscarriages for no reason. And every doctor scratching their heads, you're totally normal. And the third week, fourth, week, you know, always there's a miscarriage around the same time frame. This is an, a symptom of sihr that you don't know what's going on. Between husband and wife, everything seems fine. And then all of a sudden, when there's some romance, all of a sudden extreme anger or inexplicable feelings or pushing or whatnot, these are supernatural symptoms. When these exist, and only when you find them, otherwise, if these symptoms don't exist, it's not sihr. I have to say this, most of what we think is sihr is our imagination. It's not actual sihr. So, if you are not sure about a, a supernatural sign, then assume it is not sihr. There has to be something palpable. Bottom line with this, we conclude, don't be scared of these entities. They are creatures of Allah like all other creatures. And if you turn to Allah, you are more powerful than these creatures. These creatures are terrified of Iman, of taqwa, of dhikr, of the Qur'an. They can't stand it. And if you show fear, that fear empowers them. If your heart is trembling, cover it up and speak with a voice and say, Bismillah, I speak to you in the name of Allah. I am the servant of Allah. Get out of here, enemy of Allah. You say this with iman and thiqa, and you are going to be the one who is powerful. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا يُفْلِحُ السَّاحِرُ حَيْثُ أَتَى The magician will never be successful wherever he comes. The one who does dhikr and the Quran, the one who turns to Allah, will always be the one who wins over sihr in the short and in the long run. May Allah Azza wa protect all of us and our families and loved ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow there to be barriers between us and the world of the shayateen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Give us all righteous children and righteous grandchildren that are firm upon their iman and are protected from the world of the jinn and the shayateen. Wa jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.